Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time we're going to take a look at a retro laptop, and specifically this Toshiba Satellite 1620. This hails from 1999, a time when even fairly small laptops were still very chunky, as you can see, and they weighed quite a bit. This is, I think, about as heavy as a small house. So, let's go and take a closer look. Right, here we have our 20th century Toshiba satellite laptop and associated manuals and media that came with it when it was new. This particular model is known as a 1620 CDS PS162E, or just a 1620 CDS as we can see on the manual. Toshiba laptops date back to 1985, when the company launched the T1100, which it claimed to be the first mass market laptop computer. Certainly, there were earlier mobile computing devices, but without doubt, in the late 1980s and into the 1990s, if somebody had a laptop, it was often a Toshiba. In 2018, Sharp purchased about 80% of Toshiba's computer business, and in April 2019, changed its name from Toshiba America Client Solutions to Dynabook Americas. Toshiba laptops had always been sold as Dynabooks in Japan, but now have that name everywhere in the world. Although, as we can see, the Toshiba name still appears on the website, and I suspect that the old branding will linger on for many years. As I said in the introduction, this is a pretty bulky and heavy piece of mobile hardware. However, it's pretty typical of a laptop from 20 years ago, and it's far smaller and lighter than Toshiba's T5100 from 1987 that I looked at here on Explaining Computers six years ago. So, everything is relative, and I must return to the T5100 at some point to try and fix its hard drive. Anyway, Back with the 1620 CDS, inside there's a single core AMD K62 processor running at 475 MHz. This is coupled with 32 MB of SD RAM and what the manual claims to be a 4 GB 2.5 inch hard drive, although, as we will soon see, the actual drive is somewhat larger. The display is a 12.1 inch DSDN panel with a resolution of 800 by 600. DSDN stands for Double Layer Super Twist Pneumatic and was a common technology 20 years ago as at the time it was cheaper than the TFT or Thin Film Transistor Alternative that's still widely used today. It was, however, possible to buy this computer with a TFT screen. The laptop's keyboard is rather nice, great feel to it, nice motion to the keys, very nice to type on. The spacebar is a bit small, although you do adjust to that, and on the very positive size, we've got four full-size cursor arrows here. That's great to see full-size cursor keys. So there's no expectation in the design here that when you move your finger towards the cursor arrows, it somehow magically shrinks. In the middle of the keyboard, we find what Toshiba called an acupoint, or what is more generically known as a pointing stick or an isometric pointing device. This is worked with one finger to provide rodent functionality, and it's a bit like a joystick, although it measures force rather than movement using two resistive strain gauges. IBM called such devices track points and trademarked that term. But whatever we call it, the device is not clickable, and so we have two buttons down here below the keyboard, so we can work the pointing stick with the finger and click with the thumb to perform different rodent operations. And it's worth noting that still today, some new laptops do have pointing stick devices, including some of the latest Lenovo ThinkPads. If we take a look around the edges, at the front we find a removable battery, which when new, offered a claimed two and a half hours of runtime. We also have a CD-ROM drive, and below that, a 1.44 megabyte floppy disk drive. So all of the standard spinning disk drive technology from 20 years ago is present on this laptop. 
On the left hand side, we discover a single USB port, which has to be USB 1.1, as USB 2 was not released until the year 2000, a year after this laptop came out. We also have two 3.5mm jacks, one for microphone, one for headphone, and a physical volume control. Along from these, we then have an R11 socket for the machine's internal V19 modem. And then finally, we've got two PC card slots and a speaker. On the back of the machine, at either end, we have a fan exhaust port and a barrel jack for power. And then in the middle, we've got a 9-pin RS232C serial port, a parallel port and a VGA socket. So, this laptop has the same connectivity found on a typical desktop PC from 20 years ago. Reflecting this, on the right edge, we find a PS2 port for connecting an external mouse or keyboard, along with a second speaker. Finally, if we take a look underneath, we find a memory slot cover. So let's just quickly open this up. And uh, here we are. And yes, we can see in here, we've got an empty uh, sodium slot where we could fit some extra memory to take the memory from 32 megabytes to a maximum of 160 megabytes. So let's just now put the cover back on again. We want to be tidy. And there we are, the Toshiba Satellite 1620 CDS, a fantastic 20 plus year old laptop, which I've had a great time making a video about so far, and I think it's now high time to boot it up into operation. Right, I've now plugged in the power adapter because the laptop's battery no longer holds much charge. So if I press the button to turn it on, there we are, we've got a big reassuring noise there. Things are definitely happening. The machine is coming to life. Oh look, in touch with tomorrow, Toshiba. That's uh, reassuring, isn't it? Good to be in touch with tomorrow. Except we do have a problem here. The machine does this when you try to boot it up. I think it's because the battery that maintains the settings on the motherboard and the time and things like that, that battery will be long since dead. But do not fear, if I press F1 to resume, there we are, another little bleep. The machine should now start to boot into Windows 98. As you can see, isn't it reassuring for those of us from years gone by to see a machine booting into Windows 98? These were the days of computing that felt so different to the, the days of today. And hopefully we'll get there in a second. Yes, we're arriving. And if I do, I think this, so that we're now recording the laptop's output directly so we can see Windows 98 in all of its true glory. So we'll let things come to an end in terms of a little hourglass at the end of the, the boot up process. And I think things just about have finished off there. So let's go up to my computer using a little uh, track point thing, which glides around the screen in a very interesting fashion. Let's uh, click on that using the very robust buttons. You're not going to miss my clicks in this demo. That makes very good noises when you click on this machine. And here we are looking at my computer in Windows 98 and the hard drive on this system is divided into two partitions. As you can see, there's a C drive containing all the traditional Windows stuff. There we are. And the other partition is set up for the user, I think. There we are. That's the way it's, it's done here. And we've also got in our list the CD-ROM disk, which hasn't got anything in it. And we've also got the floppy drive. I haven't booted up a computer with a floppy drive on for quite some time. And I've got the floppy drive that came with the system right here, so I can stick it in the slot like that. Just got it in. And if we click on it here, we will open up, hopefully, a floppy disk. I've not read a floppy disk for years. And this floppy disk is the recovery disk that comes with the system, so there's nothing spectacular on it for us to play with. But we've got a folder there called BMP for bitmap images, so I'll open that up, see what they are. I have no idea. Let's just try opening up a random bitmap image. Will it give us a preview? It looks like it will. Presumably in Windows Paint. Yes, Windows Paint is showing us an image used on the recovery floppy disk. Isn't that fantastic? It doesn't take much to keep me happy when I start playing with retro hardware. Anyway, let's close that down and take a look at the menu, which is a classic Windows menu, as it will be in Windows 98. Everything divided into folders and, and categories the way it still is in 
most Linux systems these days, but sadly not in Windows 10 and 11. Oh, it is a shame what's happened to Windows, isn't it? Anyway, let's look at uh, the control panel in, in 98. Another bit of nostalgia as it comes up. Oh, there we are. Look, let's look at, say, display. I do like navigating around on older systems. Oh, look, we can change the desktop to things like tiny circles or the Windows 98 clouds. We've got their screensaver. We've got some classic Windows screensaver stuff here. Or we've got 3D flying objects. Is that flying windows? Let's have a look. And, uh, oh, no, it isn't. It's a flying 3D Windows logo. Didn't expect to see that. It was worth watching this video just to see this, wasn't it? Very exciting indeed. And let's just move on to appearance because in Windows 98, you could change the appearance yourself. You had complete control. You could go to every different aspect of the Windows user interface. So for example, we could go up here to, I don't know, the active title bar, and we could set the font and its weight and the color and, and the size ourselves, rather than Windows telling us how it thinks things should look. Anyway, as you can see, I just like thinking back to how Windows was. But a final thing I think we'll do here is to run up a program. And I think we'll choose Netscape, the browser that was so dominant for so many years. And if you're interested in retro software, you might enjoy my fairly recent video on the top five retro applications, which included Netscape, which as we can see has now booted up here. And sadly, this machine isn't online. I'm sure I must be able to get it online, but I've not managed to do that yet. But it's still nice to look at what a browser looked like not that many years ago. And down here, we've got a little yellow running person, which I think is a messaging application in Netscape. Yes, the AOL Instant Messenger, it's labeled here. It's surprising how many things we do today were sort of foreshadowed or started off in programs like Netscape. So let's come out of this and end our tour. And as we do so, I want to show you something very interesting when we shut down Windows 98, because we get a great message on the screen. And as you can see, the message is, what do you want the computer to do? And if we think about Windows today, we get the opposite. We get messages coming up in requesters saying, Windows is going to take half an hour updating itself, changing the system in ways you didn't ask for. Is that OK? You've got no choice. The, the user is no longer in control of Windows. Whereas 20 years ago, very much the idea was the computer would do what we wanted it to do. And now what we want the computer to do is to shut down. So we'll click on OK to end this session to bring this part of the video to a close. And we'll wave goodbye to Windows 98. As you probably gathered, I always like taking a look at older hardware. And in this particular retro computing episode, I found it fascinating to be reminded of how many mechanical drives used to be included in a fairly typical portable device. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.